There are two major types of dialysis. Hemodialysis is done with the blood. Uh, it takes the blood out of an artery, uh, it runs it through a filter to clean it, get the waste out, and runs it back through the vein. Peritoneal dialysis is done in the peritoneal cavity, the abdomen. Um, the patient has a catheter that can look like kind of like a, a peg tube, a feeding tube. Uh, dialysate is run into the abdominal cavity and it uses diffusion to pull the waste out of the body that way and then it comes back out into the lower bag as effluent. Effluent comes out with hemodialysis as well and it usually just looks like um, urine. So. As we talked about, our acute kidney injury patients and chronic kidney disease will need dialysis. Um, anyone with a any type of renal insufficiency, uh, people with severe medication or illicit drug toxicity, we're going to clean that out of the blood real quick and get them taken care of. Um, anyone with persistent hyperkalemia for any reason other than kidney disease. And then people with hypervolemia that does not respond to diuretics. So this could also be our congestive heart failure patients. Uh, So what are we going to see with these patients? Uh, they have fluid volume changes, which throws their electrolytes and their pH out of balance. Uh, they have waste buildup in their blood, which at the bottom there is called uremia. This manifests as cognitive impairment. Uh, they can have puritis, which is itching, and nausea and vomiting. So we see fluid overload, jugular vein distension, edema, bounding pulses, um, weight changes, and neuro changes, that's their cognitive impairment. They can have altered level of consciousness, they can have confusion, um, and then we can also see bleeding from these patients. Here we have our hemodialysis access, the tunnel catheter as we talked about, um, and then you have your AV graft or AV fistula. AV fistulas are what you're gonna see the most, and as a general nurse, you will not be accessing them, but you do have to assess them. So you are going to listen with your stethoscope right over the fistula to hear the brewy, which is spelled B-R-U-I-T. Hear the brewy. Uh, and then you want to feel the thrill. So you're going to put your hand right over it, and you are going to feel that vibration through it. The first link on this slide is the one that will let you listen to what a brewery sounds like correctly and what a, it sounds like when it's wrong, when you need to report it to a provider. As a general nurse, bedside nurse, you are going to um, report that to your provider. You're going to assess this with every one of your head to toes, every one of your focused assessments, and make sure that it is functioning properly. If it is not, it has to be reported to the provider because when these are not working, they cannot get their dialysis and we need to put in a tunnel catheter to support them in between um, until we get it figured out. Um, you will also make sure that uh, limb precautions are followed. So blood pressures cannot be taken on a limb with a fistula and blood draws can also not be taken from that limb. So if lab is drawing, this patient, you need to go in and make sure that they see your band, they see your sign on the wall, they know that they cannot draw from that arm. Uh, the second video there is from a provider in Canada, but it gives a really good explanation of the differences between hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis and why a patient would choose one or the other. Here in the United States, I don't think they have much of a choice. Um, and I do also think that it is based on um, education and the amount of education that patients will adhere to or that we give properly. So it's a quick, fast uh, video with drawings and it's just a really good way to understand that. All right, so hemodialysis and CRRT are the same thing. One just runs slower than the other. So hemodialysis can run from two to four hours and we will take off anywhere from nothing to three liters or four liters even off of a patient in that time. That's a big fluid shift. 
If the patient's blood pressure is unstable or they're just very sick, we're going to do CRRT, which means continuous renal replacement therapy. So it's still hemodialysis. It just runs 24 hours a day. So we're taking off 50 cc's an hour up to 150 cc's an hour. We can also take off nothing with that. If they are too sick and we just want to clean the blood a little bit, we're going to just run it through there and give it back without taking any fluid off. Um, you can see on the lower left picture there, that's what the filter looks like. Uh, usually in, in real life, the blood goes through the middle and the dialysate is run down over the sides. And so then the um, nutrients that are needed in the blood will be diffused across into the blood. If there's less K in the blood and we want more K in there, the K from the dialysis will go across that membrane into the blood. If there's too much K, which is usually the case, it's going to diffuse out because it's going to go from where there's too much to where there's less. So the circuit, the filter is doing the work of the kidney outside the body. So what do we monitor during hemodialysis? <clears throat> now, if your patient is too unstable, the dialysis nurse, even on a med surge unit, will come to your bedside and do it. Um, as we saw in Montecito, some will come to the bedside at my clinical and most of them will go up to the dialysis unit. Same way in most hospitals, they have a dialysis unit. Um, they will either come take the patient for dialysis or bring their smaller machine to the patient to do it at the bedside. The dialysis nurse is watching the circuit to make sure it's not clotting. Um, they are watching for air bubbles in there. They're monitoring the temperature of their dialysate so they don't make their patient too hot or too cold. Um, but you, as the patient's nurse, still have to care for them. So if they end up with hypotension, that's what you're monitoring, making sure of. You're watching to see if they have any cramping, if they start vomiting. Um, bleeding at the access site or equipment contamination is going to be the dialysis nurse's um, responsibility. They, most of them will let you know, hey, the patient's feeling nauseous, or they'll have the, the uh, patient push the button if they're able to, if they're alert um, and not sedated. We are also watching their vital signs. Uh, we don't want them to get that hypotension. Um, we're making sure that their blood pressure, if they had hypertension ahead of time, which is normal for a dialysis patient, is starting to come down gradually and not dropping very quickly. Um, dialysis nurses will monitor the coagulation studies during if, hep if heparin is used. Um, they will um, check that. They can take blood right off the machine and check it very easily. Um, and they always have protamine sulfate ready in case they need to reverse the heparin. With CRRT, we don't co anticoagulate the patient. We anticoagulate the filter. I'm not sure how that works exactly with um, the AV fistulas. They may be giving them heparin just to make sure that that fistula is still flowing. Um, so they have that ready to reverse if needed. But for us and CRRT, we are only anticoagulating the filter. Um, and then we have to provide emotional support and offer activities for patients. Think about those outpatient uh, dialysis uh, patients who are in the, um, in the little facility for four hours, three days a week. You, they probably bring their own activities because they know, but you're going to have to make sure they, they, they're kept busy. They're not bored, right? Um, patient education, we're going to make sure that they know they need to notify the nurse if they have headache, nausea, or dizziness during the dialysis run, because uh, that could indicate disequilibrium syndrome, which we will talk about a little more in a minute here. All right, so after your patient is done with hemodialysis, uh, CRT, they won't be done. We're doing this all along the run. But if they have hemodialysis, the two to four hour run, we are going to monitor their vitals and labs afterwards as well. We are checking their vitals to make sure that blood pressure has come down a little bit and is not too low. We're checking for tachycardia being uh, resolved. They should be down to a normal heart rate and hopefully not bradycardic. We are making sure that their O2 sets have increased. They should be able to breathe better. They should be having better perfusion, right? Uh, lab values, we're monitoring their BUN, creatinine, electrolytes, and their hematocrit, hemoglobin. We're making sure that they are not anemic, that we do not need to give them blood. Um, 
making sure that they're um, the that the machine did its job. So it brought down the BUN, it brought down the creatinine, their electrolytes are in normal or closer to normal range. Uh, we are comparing their pre-procedure weight with the post-procedure weight. We want to make sure that we got some of that fluid off. We're assessing for any complications, making sure, again, that the blood pressure is lower, um, that the lab values haven't gone too far in the other direction. Uh, we're making sure that they don't have that nausea, vomiting, uh, dizziness, or headache. We're going to avoid, it, avoid invasive procedures for four to six hours. Uh, this is because those HD nurses can use that heparin, so we don't want to cause them to bleed. So anything invasive, um, sometimes lab draws can't wait. It depends. Um, for, most, for the most part, we hope that these patients have lines or IVs that work to draw back, so we don't have to poke them. Um, and then our precautions for our AV fistula or graft. So reinforcing those arm precautions. Do not do any blood sticks on that arm. Do not do any blood pressure on that arm. Um, you can see in the notes there that one liter fluid equals one kilogram. Um, so that's how we know how much they should be losing compared to how much fluid we took off. Okay, here are our points for patient education. We want that patient to alert us if they have any nausea, headache, dizziness, because that could indicate that disequilibrium syndrome. That just means that we took too much fluid off. We caused too much of a fluid shift. So uh, we will have to give them some back usually. Um, we're teaching them to check the access site regularly following dialysis. If it is bleeding, we want them to apply light pressure. We don't want them to put hard pressure on it because it can uh, ruin the fistula. It can cause damage to the fistula. We teach them to contact the provider if that bleeding lasts longer than 30 minutes after dialysis is complete. We teach them to listen to the brewery and feel the thrill themselves. So if those are missing, um, they do have to contact the provider. And we also teach them to look for any signs of infection. So we're going to teach them if it's red, if it's warm, if it's swollen, we need if there's any discharge, we need to know um, and you need to let the provider know. We teach them to take their medication and supplements for folate loss uh, and how to take them. And then we teach them about a well-balanced diet high in folate uh, for nutrition. Uh, we want to make sure that they are getting all the nutrients needed from their diet so that we don't need to replace any of those things. Um, we teach them to avoid lifting heavy objects with the arm that the fistula or graft is in, and then avoid carrying objects that compress or constrict the extremity. We also teach them not to sleep on the extremity. We have to be very careful about the way they sleep because, again, that hard pressure on that could ruin the fistula. They also get taught hand exercises that promote maturation of that fistula. So when they first get it, they are doing hand exercises to get that fistula to the point where it can be used. And like I've said before, until it is ready to use, they will have a tunneled central line. Here are the complications that patients can have during hemodialysis. Um, clotting infection at the site, uh, so we're assessing for the brewery and the thrill and signs of infection, and that's all the time, not just during a run. Um, disequilibrium syndrome, as we've talked about, not only from fluid volume decreasing too quickly, but also from the BUN decreasing too quickly. So um, if this happens to the patient regularly, the dialysis nurse will run um, the dialysis slower. Uh, we can also use anticonvulsants or barbiturates if needed. So this is if it happens severely, these patients can have seizures. Um, hypotension, uh, we are going to replace fluid volume slowly, lower the head of the bed, and stop dialysis if the uh, blood pressure does not respond to the fluids we're giving. We are going to um, watch for anemia. Mon by monitoring the blood levels, um, we can give erythropoietin if needed, the epigen that we talked about before, filgastrum, um, and we can also give blood transfusions if they end up too anemic, their hemoglobin is too low. Um, and then com another complication is infectious disease. So we combat this by using sterile equipment, using aseptic technique to access uh, the fistula or the HD line, 
and then standard precautions are used uh, during the run. All right, so peritoneal dialysis is the treatment of choice for older adults or anyone who cannot tolerate anticoagulation, has difficulty with vascular access, um, is unstable or has chronic infections, or has chronic diseases like diabetes, heart failure, and severe hypertension. This offers increased patient control and flexibility of at-home treatment. Again, that is why I feel that it is not used in the U.S. quite as much as other countries um, because it's patient education here is lacking from both ends. We don't give it well enough and patients don't receive it well enough when it is given. Um, if you have a peritoneal dialysis patient on the unit, a dialysis nurse will uh, maintain that for you unless you work at a smaller hospital. They probably have pay or nurses on the unit who will be trained to do so. Um, if you have any alarms, um, you will call that nurse who is covering it and they will come maintain it. They will initiate, they will discontinue. The patient does not do it on their own when they are in the hospital. What do we monitor during peritoneal dialysis? Vitals and glucose. We want to make sure vitals are stable and the dialysate uh, include, contains glucose. So we're making sure the blood sugar does not get too high from that. Uh, we are monitoring inflow versus outflow and the color and the amount of that outflow. Um, outflow should be look like urine. That's the effluent I talked about earlier. It should be clear or light yellow, usually light yellow. Um, and the outflow should be equal to or exceed the amount of inflow. Everything we put in should come out and then some because uh, we're trying to remove that fluid, that waste, right? So we are looking for signs of infection as well. Um, not only at the site, but in the peritoneal cavity. We can see that in the outflow. Bloody, frothy, or cloudy outflow um, or purulent could indicate infection. So that access site, we're looking to make sure there's no leakage, no redness, no warmth, uh, no edema, and we're making sure that it's still in the correct place. So you can measure that as well. Um, we need to make sure that there is no leakage because that could indicate it is out of place. Um, any redness, warmth, any of that could be signs of infection. We are monitoring the times of infusion, dwell, and outflow. We need to make sure that is, it is running as prescribed. So for the most part, they do use a machine for this. So hopefully that will take care of that issue. However, if they do it by gravity, we need to make sure even with a machine that the um, catheter is not kinked in any way and taking longer to flow. So it should infuse in the prescribed time, stay in the abdomen at the prescribed time, and then come out in the prescribed time. Um, you can reposition the patient if outflow is inadequate or taking longer. Um, if flow is decreased due to a clot, the catheter can be milked. Uh, we just want to be very careful with that and make sure we let the provider know and also educate the patients to do so. We are using asepsis of the access site, so standard precautions are always used when administering and everything, but cleaning and everything like that, we need to make sure it doesn't get infection from us caring for it. And then we're monitoring outflow bag placement. So the outflow bag is always lower than the inflow, even with a machine. Um, and then as usual, we are providing emotional support during the run if they are in our care. Post peritoneal dialysis, we are monitoring their weight and their labs. Obviously, we want to make sure their BU and creatinine are coming down, their electrolytes are within normal ranges. We are monitoring their weight to make sure we don't leave any extra fluid on them and that they are losing some fluid. Here is our patient education. Obviously, we are going to teach them care of the access site to decrease chance of infection, how to perform their peritoneal dialysis exchanges. We're giving them support group resources. We want them to take their medications as prescribed and follow all their instructions, um, take any supplements as ordered, and then we teach them those possible complications and how to address them, like if there's a clot milking the catheter and um, how to change positions, how to troubleshoot basically. Um, if the um, inflow outflow is not equal, if it's not going in the prescribed time and all that good stuff.
stuff that we just talked about. Here are some complications. We just talked about the poor inflow or outflow a couple times. They can have hyperglycemia or hyperlipidemia. The glucose is in the dialysate, and uh, there could also be lipids in there sometimes. Uh, they could have protein loss, infection, or peritonitis. And for those complications, they will have to let the provider know. They need to be able to identify that, however.